So uh, we'll notice, I mean, so in this case, this subproject directory isn't actually part of Git right now. I, it, I've never added it, and I can't add it because the only thing inside of it's a .out file, and that's not a Git control file. So if I actually wanted to add this directory, let's go back into it. Um, and I'm going to touch a new file in here called like file three. So now I have the .out file, which it's ignoring, but I also have this file three that it's not. So if I do a git status now, we're going to see a little bit different than normal. It's saying untracked files, but it's not giving the name of this file three. Instead, it's giving dot slash. So dot slash is actually referring to subproject itself. So what Git is telling us is it now recognizes that there's a directory that has files in it that it's not controlling. Um, so what we actually want to add to Git is not the file. We want to add the directory. And by default, when you do this, Git will automatically add anything inside the directory that's not in a Git ignore list. So we can just do git add dot. And now if I do git status, see, so now it's actually going to say, OK, I'm going to commit this new file 3. Even though I didn't say add file 3, I said add the directory. I also think I could have done git add file 3 and it would have figured out what I want because it's pretty smart. But normally when you create a new directory and there's files inside of it you want to commit, you add the directory, it automatically brings all the files inside of it. Um, so let's do git commit dash m and we'll say added new directory with file 3. All right. OK. So done committing. Um, We've done looking at, so like we've said, git log will basically, I mean, we've been building this up, right? But git log will tell us what's been going on this whole time. Um, let's look at figuring out what changed between two different commits. So a useful thing to do in Git is you want to do what's called a diff. So you want to figure out, well, I have these notes here, but what actually changed, right? What actually is different between this commit and this commit? So there's a command to do that. It's called git diff. If we run git diff by itself, we're going to get nothing. If we run git diff with essentially two of these commit IDs, so I can run git log again. So let's see what, let, let's look at two changes to the readme file. So let's take the most recent version of the readme file. So that's this commit right here. So I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to do a git diff, and then I'm going to give it so that's the commit ID. I just copied out the commit ID from the one that says yada yada right here. So I want to compare that version of the readme file with, let's go back a couple. So let's compare it to. Well, there's a couple of things we can do here. So the word head pretty much always refers to your current commit, so your most recent commit in this case. So if we do this, it's going to show me anything that's changed in the readme file between this commit and my most recent. We'll see that the things that have changed is I've added this file. So I've done, I've basically, I've added one new file between those. Um, if we, we can, instead of saying head, we can actually look at the difference between two iterations of the readme file. So let's go back to our very first commit of the readme file. So I'm going to go back here and grab this commit ID. So I'm going to do a git diff again, only this time instead of diff, diffing it against head, I'm going to diff it against that original version. So now you're getting, this is what we call standard diff markup. You may not be used to reading this. You learn to read it eventually. Uh, what this basically is, is it's a line by line, it's a line by line definition of everything that's changed in the readme file. So what's going on here is, I mean, it's telling me a few other things too, but if we actually look at the readme file, so it's saying this minus is saying you removed something, or in this case, yeah. So it's basically, it happened to do with the order I did it. So if I'd switch the order, these would be additions. But it's basically saying, these are lines that I've added, and they all happen to be here in the readme file. Then it's giving me some other info as well. So I also added these. So this is my gitignore file, right? It's telling me I added the gitignore file, so on and so forth. I can scroll through this, so it's not that far to scroll through. Um, 
But essentially, if I kept scrolling through this, it would show me every change that I made to the file along the way. Um, this syntax can be a little hard to read. Often, if you actually want to look at changes like that, it's much more useful to use uh, a GUI tool. I wonder if I have it installed on here. I don't know that I do. So there's a program called Git GUI or Git K. So this is essentially a GUI version that will sometimes, if you're dipping files, this will give me a uh, slightly better read on what's going on. So this is my list of all of my commits, right um, here. And then if I kind of look down here, it's showing me what changed in each individual commit, so on and so forth. So sometimes when you need to start doing complex dipping, it's actually easier to use this GitK tool. There's good. Read me is online, you can read about to essentially go over exactly everything this tool can do. Um, but there is, it's essentially a GUI for everything we're doing in Git. Uh, and it's mainly helpful when you're trying to compare various parts of your change history. So I'm going to close this again. Uh, so let's look at what happens when we delete something inside a Git project. Are there any questions before we go into that? Okay. So there is a command, git rm, where I can essentially remove one of these files. So if you use git rm, what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to delete the file and then automatically stage it for you. You could also just use the rm command, but then you would have to essentially add your remove, uh, which is a little bit weird. So it's almost always easier to use git remove. So I haven't committed this yet. So if I like accidentally deleted that file, say, I could actually use what it's telling me here. So say I didn't want to remove that file. If I do a git reset head, it's actually going to restore that file. So if I do ls, oh, fail. It's not actually back. OK, let's try it again. So git reset is actually going to remove my delete commit, but it didn't actually restore the file. If I want to restore the file, I need to now do git checkout file one. And now if I do an ls, we'll see file one's back. So with those two commands, I can essentially restore that file. Uh, we can delete it again. So this time we won't use git rm. We'll just delete it manually. So if I do rm file one, and now I do git status, it's saying you have an uncommitted delete. So to commit that delete, we need to actually do the same. So this is why you never do it this way, right? Because you end up having to run the R in either way. So now I'm going to do that. Now it's going to say, OK, we're going to save your delete. And now we can actually save it by doing a git commit dash m, remove file one. OK. You can also rename things in git. So there's a command git move. Uh, if you want to rename a file, it's important that you do it this way. If you just use the regular move command, Git registers it as a delete and a new file, which isn't necessarily bad, but it means you lose all your change history for the file. Whereas if you do a git mv, it's going to essentially remember what the file used to be called. So if you need to roll back to a previous state, you can get there even though you changed the name of the file. So if we want to change one of these, right, we could change file 2 and rename it file 3. And now if we do a get status, it's going to say there's a rename, file 2 to file 3. We need to commit that change and rename the few files. All right. Deleting or renaming, any questions? OK. So that's kind of the core workings of Git overall. Uh, we're going to take a look at, I'm going to move shift over and let's look at GitHub and kind of using Git to do collaborative tech stuff because that's what it's really useful for as well. There's a ton of other basic things you can do with Git that we're not getting into here. Um, I mean, like how you do the diffing can get a lot more advanced. Git actually gives you tools to like help you track down a bug by essentially taking you through your change history and letting you rerun a unit test over and over again until you get to the point where it breaks. And then you can do what's called a git bisect that basically splits your git tree and says, here's what wasn't working, here's what, or something in here broke it, and then dive into that to try to find it. So it, it's a really far more powerful tool than just these basic things, but this is kind of the basic of changing your commits. Uh, I guess the thing we didn't do, well, I'm not sure I really did a little bit, but 
Um, the git revert command lets you roll back to a previous point. You could stick here any of those commit ideas we, IDs we saw. So if you do git log and you want to just go back to a previous point, git revert, put that here. Now, you're not permanently back. You can then come back to head. So if you do git revert head again, it'll bring you back up to the front. Um, so you've got to realize you're going to dancing through a tree. If you go back, make a change, then you kind of have a side tree. And you have to do what's called merging, which we'll get to here maybe after we get to the GitHub stuff. But there's tons of other things you can do. There's good tutorials online. I mean, keep scratching the surface.